Come on. Let's go. Well, winter has finally arrived here in Colorado. We have a little bit of snow, and it sure is nice to see. We've gotten our fences repaired from the windstorm. Come on, Penny, let's go. Now we just need the back of the house repaired. One of the things that's saddest for us is having to have the two ponderosa pines removed. Well, one fell in the house, but we had to cut the other one down. Come on. You want to say hello to everybody out there? Say, hey, welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is Penny, and I'm one of the world's best dogs, aren't I? You want to get down? You want to get down? Okay, let's put you down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thanks, yeah. At the end of last week's video, I said that we would look at Luke chapter 4 this week. Well, I lied. As I was putting this video together, I suddenly realized that the reading from the epistles for this Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Epiphany, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know what? You really can't do much better than that chapter. So I hope you don't mind, but let's take a look at Paul's definition of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The great F.F. F. Bruce thought that chapter 13 is one of the most strikingly original things that St. Paul ever wrote. At the very end of Paul's discussion of the body of Christ, which I covered in the last video, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes, Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will still show you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is love. It always surprises me that Christians seek after different gifts with great earnestness. In my world, the amount of time, money, and energy that people will expend to attend seminary so that they can teach, preach, or lead better never ceases to impress me. Yet, how much time and effort do we put into building up love? The Greek word that Paul uses for God's unconditional love in 1 Corinthians 13 is agape. And you will often hear people define that as God's unconditional love. I hate to disappoint you, but that is not what the word means. But in this chapter, Paul redefines that word and loads it with new meaning. So that after 1 Corinthians is read and spread throughout the early church, it takes on that, those connotations of meaning. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. If you're new here, my name is David Paris. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and preaching in seminary and other graduate schools and bring it to anyone, anywhere on YouTube. And that idea just really struck me for the first time when COVID hit, what, two and a half years ago. I don't know what took me so long, but I think it's a great idea and I hope this channel grows and I hope these videos encourage you and strengthen you in your faith and your study of the Bible. So remember to drink deeply from the Bible. A real simple structure and overview of 1 Corinthians 13 is that this chapter breaks down into three nice, neat parts. In the first three verses, Paul looks at the superiority of love in relationship to other gifts. In the middle section, he gives a definition of what love is. And at the very end, he returns to the question of the superiority of love in verses 8 through 13. Part A. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, the superiority of love. If I speak in the tongue of mortals and angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. John Chrysostom, who lived around 350 AD, felt that each and every phrase in verses 1 through 7 was an antidote to the problems that Paul was confronting at Corinth. The Corinthians were jealous, self-promoting, puffed up, shameful. Each one seeking after his own advantage, they were easily provoked, and reckoners of wrongdoing, according to Chrysostom. Now, for Paul, 
Love is not an abstract ideal. All of the aspects and facets of love in the first seven verses address problems and issues that Paul was addressing in the first 12 chapters of the letter of 1 Corinthians. Read through 1 Corinthians and see if you can spot the various sections earlier in the text that Paul is referring to and alluding to here in chapter 13. You can post your observations in the comments under this video. I would love to hear and see what you see in the letter as well. In the first three verses, what I want you to do is notice the structure of these verses. They're all parallel to one another. Paul opens with an if clause. This is followed by I do not have love, and it ends with some form of negation of who we are. For example, in verse one, if I speak in tongues, but I don't have love, I am nothing but a clanging cymbal. I'm making just a lot of noise. In verse 2, this is applied to prophecy, knowledge, and faith. And if we don't have love, we are nothing. Notice that tongues, prophecy, knowledge, wisdom were all recognized values in the early church. But Paul relativizes them here. Hans Konzelman, when he wrote on this passage, said, These gifts cannot make a man worth anything. Without love, love is the basic attribute which confers worth. In verse 3, we run into a problem. The NRSV reads, If I hand over my body so that I may boast. Many translations read, If I hand over my body to be burned. Now there's a question here about which is the best word in the ancient and earliest Greek manuscripts. Does this refer to be burned or to boast? And believe it or not, it all boils down to one little letter in Greek. Is there a chi or a theta here? Is it kau the somai to burn or kau somai to boast? There is good evidence for both of these words, but boast has more evidence. Probably what happened is that in the early church, when they were in the process of copying the New Testament letters by hand, someone either made a mistake and they changed the letter from a chi to a theta or a theta to chi, or they thought that the person before them made a mistake and they were correcting it. Now, a scribe could have thought that it should be burned because they thought that Paul was alluding to the story of Daniel in the fiery furnace. Or it could be that once persecution broke out against the early church, the copyists thought that it must refer to martyrdom because that is what they were experiencing. In either case, self-sacrifice without love means nothing at all. In part two, verses four through seven, Paul defines what love is. Starting with verse four, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. When Paul defines love, he uses two positive, eight negative, and five positive traits. And in the Greek, these are all verbs. In English, sometimes we have to use adjectives. So for example, when Paul says love is patient, we might translate that better as love acts in a patient manner to bring across the verbal aspect of these words. He doesn't describe love in the abstract, but in concrete attitudes, behaviors, and actions. Paul gives us a practical list of what we could use to see if someone is loving, or if we are acting in a loving manner. Are we patient? Kind? Envious? Do I boast? Am I arrogant? Am I rude? In Paul's day, these attributes of love that Paul lifts here would not have been embraced by the average person. Strength, honor, power, esteem, these were all traits that were held up in that culture. And guess what? They are today as well. Look at how often we hold up strong and powerful people as role models. What would our country, our political parties, or our culture look like if the traits that Paul lists here were the top in our list of virtues? If we had leaders that were patient, kind, not envious, boastful, or arrogant or rude. 
If they didn't insist in their own way that they weren't irritable or resentful, that they didn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoiced in the truth at all times, that they bore all things, believed all things, hoped all things, endured all things. What would our country look like if these were the virtues that we placed highest on the pedestal? In the list of the eight negative virtues, in other words, love is not this, we see love defined as what is not natural or not human. We get irritable. We seek our own way. This is what is natural to us, but that is not what love is. As such, love is ultimately dependent on our relationship with God, who is the source of love because he is love. For example, where it says, love does not insist on its own way. In those moments when I don't seek my own or insist on my own way, then I know that something beyond me is enabling me to behave in this way. And I experience God's transformation in a small manner in my life. Love is something that God has to instill into our lives so it becomes the ground of our very existence. Uh, where was I? Verse 7. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Now these are traits or verbs or actions that we extend to other people. A great test to see where we stand in relationship to love is to replace the word love here with ourselves and make it a question. Am I patient? Am I kind? Am I envious or boastful? Do I have arrogance? Am I rude? Do I insist on my own way? And I immediately see how far short I fall of the standard of love and how much I need to grow up into love. Do I bear all things in regard to others? Do I believe the very best for them? Do I hope all things for their best? In this way, love calls us forward. Love calls us to grow up. Love calls us to be like Christ. This brings us to part three, verses eight through 13, and we go back to this idea of the superiority of love once again. Starting with verse eight. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I only know in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been known fully. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest is love. This section emphasizes the eternal permanence of love as opposed to all the other gifts and attributes that are going to pass away. In verse 8, this clause, love never ends, F.F. Bruce wrote again that love does not belong to this age only, but reigns in the eternal order. The word that is used for end here, love never ends, some translations have failed, love never fails, but in the Greek, the word is fall. It's like walking along and you trip over something and fall flat on your face. Love does not get tripped up, it does not fall down. Up until now, love is what completes the gifts or gives them worth, verses one through three. But now love is seen in contrast to the gift. They are not manifestations of the eternal in this age, but love is. Prophecy will come to an end. People will no longer speak in tongues and knowledge will come to an end. For me, that last one really hits home because I spent at least 15 years of my adult life chasing various degrees, and guess what? All that's going to pass away when I pass from this age into the next. In verse 9, Paul compares the three gifts, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, to little tiny parts. The German theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg liked to describe our passing from this age into eternity and coming into the presence of God as coming into the totality of reality. It's like our trying to understand who God is by putting together a 10,000 piece theological jigsaw puzzle. And for some reason, we always get so caught up and excited about one piece or the other. Look at this, look at my part. Isn't this cool? Look at how it pulls this whole section together and helps us to understand these eternal mysteries. 
But when we pass over an NT attorney, we're not even going to realize that we've dropped our little piece of the puzzle from our hands, never to remember what we thought was so amazing ever again. This is a really hard puzzle, by the way. Vincent Van Gogh's irises. That takes a while. Paul then gives us two analogies of what this will be like. The first analogy, the first analogy is, is that when we shift into the age to come, it will be like growing up from a child to an adult. What was acceptable for the child is no longer appropriate for the adult, and change has taken place. They have matured. The second analogy is seen dimly or distorted in a mirror, enigmatai. This is then compared with our present knowledge and our future knowledge. Now this is probably an allusion back to Moses and his passage where he meets God. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 8, Yahweh says of Moses, With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in dark speech, and he beholds the form of the Lord. When the book of Numbers was translated from Hebrew into Greek, the Septuagint, somewhere around 300 to 100 AD, the translators used the Greek word enigmatai. It's the same word that Paul uses here. There in Numbers, it refers to dark speech or through riddles. In the second half of verse 12, Paul leaves the analogies behind. Our present impartial and distorted knowledge in the present age is going to be superseded by knowledge so perfect as he writes, now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. Notice how we are limited by partial distorted knowledge right now, but God is not limited by this partial knowledge. He knows us fully and perfectly, yet all those attributes of love above, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, is how God loves us. And then finally, in verse 13 of chapter 13, Paul brings his argument to a head, and he looks at faith, hope, and love. Now, these three were the highest virtues in the early Christian church, but even faith and hope do not hold a candle to love. Why is love greater? Because in the age to come, faith will give way to open vision and understanding. Hope will be swallowed up by realization but love is going to remain unchanged. I'm going to close with a quote from the great Karl Barth about how much greater love is than all of the spiritual gifts or the virtues of faith and hope. Barth writes that because the sun is rising, therefore all lights go out. Be sure to check out some of my other videos if this one encouraged you and challenged you in your faith. In fact, at the very end, YouTube will recommend what they think is the best video of mine for yours. I would love to hear from you what YouTube thought was the best video of mine for you to watch next. And you can put that in the comments underneath. Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace.